Hi everybody, welcome to the middle of nowhere, and welcome to part 3 of how to build a PC. In part 1 I went over each part of a build, what to take into consideration when buying parts for a PC, and a high level explanation of those parts. In part 2 I put together this budget build and successfully booted it into the BIOS. In today's video I'm going to go over installing Microsoft Windows, setting up the BIOS to get the most out of this PC, and also installing some of the extra bits of software I like to have on my PCs. While most of what I go over today will apply to both AMD and Intel based systems, there will be a few things specific to AMD builds, but mostly when it comes to the BIOS. To install Windows, I'll need my USB Windows installer, which I have right here. These are super easy to set up and create, and if you don't know how to make one, pause this video and check out my how to create a USB Windows 10 or 11 installer video. Don't worry about me, I'll read a comic while you go and watch it. A few moments later. Welcome back. If you watched the how to make a Windows USB installer video, excellent. If not, no worries, you can always watch it later. Did you know you don't even need to purchase a copy of Windows to use it? You can install the operating system and use it completely free without an activation key. However, you will have to deal with a watermark at the bottom of your screen, and some of the operating system's features, such as account personalization, will be disabled. If you do intend to purchase a copy of Windows, you have a few options to choose from. First, there's the retail version. Retail licenses are the most expensive, but at least you'll have the peace of mind knowing you have a genuine Microsoft Windows key. You can buy a retail version as an activation code only and create your own installer, or you can pay a little extra to have one that comes with a USB installer. Retail activation codes let you use the Windows key on your new PC, and years from now when you decide to build a new one, you should be able to use the same activation code as it won't be tied to your old hardware. You can buy retail activation keys at brick and mortar stores such as Best Buy or online from Microsoft directly, or at Newegg, Amazon, or at another official Microsoft partner. Your second option is to buy an OEM or system builder license. These can be somewhat cheaper, around 30 to 50 bucks less than the retail counterparts. OEM licenses are usually meant for companies that are building several systems rather than individuals for personal use. This isn't to say you can't use these versions of Windows, however, these activation keys can be tied to your hardware, so if you end up replacing, let's say, your motherboard or CPU, you may be asked to reactivate Windows, and when you do, there's a chance your OEM activation code won't work. I've used OEM licenses before and have not run into this issue. OEM or system builder licenses are mainly purchased online, and you can easily find them on Newegg or Amazon. Finally, we come to the third option, and that is to buy a Windows license from those key seller sites that sell cheap video games and OS keys. You'll definitely need to supply your own USB Windows installer if you go this route, and these activation keys are more than likely the OEM version and not retail. The Windows keys sold on these sites are incredibly inexpensive, priced anywhere from 13 to 30 bucks. The catch with these sites is whether or not the keys they sell are legit and legal. Most people agree they are considered grey market keys, bought in bulk probably from countries where the keys are cheaper anyway. The choice for you then becomes a moral one, more than a fiscal one. Are you okay with buying an activation key that might not be 100% legal to save some money? Through my research, I'm still not entirely sure how above or below board these sites and keys are. Having said that, I myself have used sites like VIPSCDKey.com and have had only one issue where an activation code stopped working within a few days of purchase. I contacted customer support and they issued me a new code immediately and it worked ever since. The choice really is up to you where and how you want to buy your copy of Windows, and after you figure that out, the next thing you need to decide is which version of Windows to buy, Home or Pro. Either version is fine, but just know Windows Pro is more expensive. Without getting into the differences between the two flavors of the operating system, the majority of users looking to just game or set up a home office PC will do fine with Windows Home. If you want to tinker, need some extra layers of security or encryption, want to run a virtual machine, or intend to conduct any kind of business, I recommend going with Windows Pro. If you're interested in learning more, I've put links to a few articles on the differences between Windows 11 Home and Pro in the description. All right. Let's install the OS. Well, the first thing we're going to do is insert our USB installer uh, drive. And I do recommend putting this into the rear I.O. as opposed to your case's front I.O. That way you don't have to run the risk of your case I.O. accidentally glitching out or anything like that. After we've plugged in the USB drive, go ahead and turn on the computer. The PC should boot automatically using the USB drive, but if it doesn't, you'll need to go into the BIOS and set the boot order to the USB drive as first or primary. And as you can see, Windows is booting up off the drive. So on this screen, we're gonna go ahead and choose our language and location, but we are in the United States. My primary language will be English, the current format, blah, blah, blah. So I'm not gonna change anything here. Hit next. Now we'll go ahead and click install now. 
So this takes us to the activation page where you can type out your activation key if you have one. You can always activate later, just make sure you install the version of Windows that corresponds to your activation key. Also keep in mind you cannot activate a Pro license on a home install or a home license on a Pro install, so be sure to install the right version for your license. So after clicking I don't have an activation key, I'm brought to this window. Uh, this is where I can choose the version of Windows that I want to install. Its default is home. Here you can select Pro if you want. They're all 64-bit architecture, and we're gonna go ahead and go with Home. Click Next. We'll go ahead and speed read through this agreement. Accept it, hit Next. And we're not gonna upgrade, we're going to hit Custom Windows Install. We have our hard drive here. If you don't see your drive at all, make sure any cables you used are fully plugged in if you're using any kind of 3.5 inch or 2.5 inch drives. Make sure your M.2 drive is fully seated. You may also need to update the drivers for your hard drive. And to do this, you'll need to download them to a USB drive from your storage device's site. Insert the USB drive and then click load driver. You might also be able to download directly from the internet if you're connected. Hopefully you won't run into any issues. If you still cannot install Windows into the selective drive, you can try to format it if that button is available. For us, it's not. So I can click on it all day long, nothing's happening. So we'll go ahead, have it selected. It's our only drive. I'll hit next and the install has started. Now this is gonna take some time. I do have a USB uh, Wi-Fi uh, connected to this computer, so I should be able to connect to the internet pretty much immediately and get everything up to date as well. After the initial install is completed, you'll be taken through the setup process where you can set your region and keyboard layout, connect to a network, name your device and set up a user if you want. Don't worry about choosing something good. You can always rename both your PC and the user if you need to. Choose your privacy settings. By default, these are all turned on. To limit the amount of data Microsoft can gather, I recommend that you turn all of these off. After you click next, Windows will get ready and you'll be on your way installing even more updates and software. Do keep in mind that there will be several restarts during your Windows setup. This is normal and you shouldn't worry about it. However, do make sure when you install Windows and any other software that there is no possibility of losing electricity. And here we are into Windows. This whole process so far has taken roughly 10 to 12 minutes. That's not bad. Now that I've installed Windows, I have a few things left to do. I'll download and install some utilities and nice to have software. Install a motherboard software and also update anything from the motherboard support site that needs it, such as the BIOS, audio and LAN drivers, or any other drivers and software. I'll also make sure all my AMD chipset and other drivers are up to date and download AMD Ryzen Master. Finally, I'll go to the BIOS and set up my RAM to run at its rated speed, activate resizable bar, and ensure PBO is on. Just know this is not a one-size-fits-all approach and is just more or less how I like to install Windows and get some software going right afterwards. While initial installation of Windows doesn't take very long, updating it can take hours. And because it can take so long, I definitely recommend doing all your Windows updates before you go ahead and install any other software, such as web browsers, games, utilities, etc., or even set up anything in the BIOS. After I finish updating Windows, I'll start by downloading some web browsers, utilities, and other software. And I can get most of these in one place by going to nightnight.com. This is a cool website that lets you choose from a plethora of software, creates one install package for you to download, and then you can install everything at once. It's really convenient and saves you time from having to go to multiple websites. For builds I intend to sell, I don't install much as I don't want to bog the system down with too much bloat. I usually just install Chrome, Firefox, 7-Zip, and VLC. For your own build, you may want to install additional programs such as Steam and Discord. After that, I will go and get CPU-Z, GPU-Z, and HW Monitor. The Z apps provide various kinds of information about your PC, while HW Monitor is great for keeping track of system temps, power usage, etc. They don't take up much storage space or resources either. With CPU-Z, you can also check to see what BIOS version is installed on your motherboard. This will come in handy as you may want or need to download and install the latest BIOS version. After loading the app, click the main board tab, and you'll see the, your current BIOS version in the BIOS section. I'll make note of that as I'll be visiting the motherboard support page to see what is available for install. Another piece of software you may want is for your storage device or devices. As I'm using a silicon power drive in this build, I'll be installing SP Toolbox. This software provides information about your drive's health, can run diagnostic tests, perform a secure race, and more. 
Most storage makers have their own versions of software similar to the SP Toolbox. Next I'll go to the AMD site to make sure my chipset drivers for the B450 chipset and any other drivers are up to date. And while I'm here I'll get Ryzen Master. Ryzen Master lets me overclock my CPU in Windows if I so choose. Again, it's not necessary, but it's nice to have. Because I'm using an AMD GPU, I'll also install AMD's Adrenaline software. Adrenaline lets me adjust fan speeds, record my screen, and even overclock the GPU if I want. I definitely recommend reading through and watching all the tutorials on how to use the software on the Adrenaline website. If you want to both tinker and get the most out of your AMD GPU, then definitely do this. If I was using an NVIDIA GPU, I'd install GeForce Experience and NVIDIA's control panel. Finally, it's time to go to my motherboard's product page and see what software utilities and drivers are available to download. Here I'll find BIOS updates, audio, LAN, and other updates, some utilities that might be of use, and of course ASRock's Polychrome RGB software, which I'll need so I can customize the lighting for my RGB fans. You don't really have to download any of these bits of software, it's completely up to you, and if you feel anything is taking up too much space or resources, uninstall it. After I've downloaded all the software and have completely updated Windows, it's time to tweak the BIOS to get the most out of my system. Because I learned there is a more current BIOS than the one already installed, I can also take this time to update it. I'll want to do this before I set XMP or anything else, as updating the BIOS tends to erase these settings anyway, so there's no point in doing that twice. You'll need a USB drive that's been formatted to FAT32. You'll want to then copy the BIOS file onto that drive, insert it into your USB port, and when you're booting up the system into the BIOS, you'll have it ready to be able to install. Installation takes roughly five minutes or so. I won't be doing a lot in the BIOS, I'll just be turning on the XMP profile for my RAM, also known as DOCP for AMD CPUs, although you might see it under either name. Intel it will be XMP. I'll enable resizable bar, and for my AMD CPU, I'll make sure PBO or PBO2, depending on what motherboard and CPU I have, is enabled. By default, it's set to automatic, but you might want to just have it enabled at all times. And it's done. Windows is fully up to date, drivers are installed, the BIOS has been set, I've added some base software, I've set the RGB fans to rainbow for even more FPS, and I've spent a day or so installing several games. All that's left to do now is show you how well this PC has performed in 1080p gaming, and give you my final thoughts on the build. This PC is an excellent 1080p gaming machine. After tweaking some settings for each of the games I tested, I was able to have a smooth playing experience. I was definitely surprised by my 1% and 0.1% lows in Cyberpunk as I was able to get near parity for those two things. Fortnite is always finicky in my opinion when it comes to finding the right balance of performance to looks, especially for budget systems. You want high FPS, but you also don't want to be playing a pixelated mess. GTA 5, as always, proved to be a pain when it comes to getting those 1% and 0.1% lows to be higher than single or low double digits. Rather than relying on the benchmark, I opted to play at every setting I went with. I definitely found it interesting and odd that the default settings had the best performance, considering default is pretty much very high. I must not have noticed a particular setting that got reduced, which gave me those fantastic results in default. In the Elden Ring, I was able to pretty much reach the 60fps mark at near max settings. I did have to reduce a few things to get there, but that's the trade-off with the budget build. All in all, I learned this PC can play AAA games no problem if you're willing to make some visual sacrifices. I also found it can definitely be an eSports slayer no problem. I'm happy with this PC build overall. It's affordable, performs well, and was fun to build. Temperatures never got too high, and the fans were never so loud as to be obnoxious. I think all that's left to do is a post-mortem. If you've ever done project management, you'll know exactly what that is. If you haven't, well, it's when I review the project, go over what went right, 
what could have gone better, and what I'd do differently for next time. As for what went right, I came in under the $700 budget. My total cost was around $674 before taxes. You can currently put together this build with an alternate motherboard for around 647. I achieved reaching 60 FPS or higher on all the games tested at medium to high settings. Elden Ring notwithstanding since it has a 60 FPS cap. Building the PC was easy, there's plenty of room in the Thermaltake S200TG for all the parts and for cable management. The components all worked well together without issue. Software installation was for the most part flawless, albeit time consuming, but there's no way to get around that. So what could have gone better? I don't really have any complaints as really everything regarding the build itself went smoothly. The only issue that came up was that I couldn't record video in Adrenaline software. For some reason that option was missing. After doing some research I found it's a known issue but I also couldn't find out a way to fix it. The only other thing that could have gone better was getting some more performance out of the PC. And this brings me right into what I'd do differently. If I could do this build over, I'd buy a Ryzen 5 5600 CPU and an inexpensive B550 motherboard to get more out of the Radeon RX 6600, and with prices as they are, I could do so without going over my $700 cap. As it stands, it is currently operating in PCIe 3.0 mode by 8, which is essentially PCIe 4.0 by 4. While in part 1 of how to build a PC I said the performance hit of putting this GPU into a PCIe 3.0 slot would be negligible, I also now know that for nearly the same amount of money I could have upgraded the CPU and motherboard to squeeze every bit of power from the RX 6600, thus improving my overall experience. Another benefit of going with a B550 motherboard and 5600 CPU is I could take advantage of the PCIe 4.0 speeds for NVMe storage should I want to upgrade or add a faster drive in the future. Beyond that, depending on the cost increase with these two changes, I'd also buy RAM with a lower cast latency, which will help with my 1% lows, and a PCIe 4.0 NVMe drive to pair with the PCIe 3.01. As for the immediate future, the only thing I'd do is buy a large capacity hard drive for mass storage. A 2 terabyte drive to store all my documents, pictures, music, and those games I don't play as often would be a great addition. And that's all I have to say about this budget PC build, and these how to build a PC videos. Thanks for watching everybody. I hope this three part series has provided you with helpful information on how to build a PC from part picking to first boot up to playing your favorite games. If you liked the videos or found them helpful, leave a like and post any questions or comments you have down below. Show your support for the channel by getting subscribed and don't forget to turn on notifications so you don't miss out on any future content. I'm Seth and I'll see you next time in the middle of nowhere.